Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles and the long-awaited preview of the first British destroyer to be introduced into World of Warships, HMS Campbelltown, although technically not really British because she was formerly the USS Buchanan, a First World War vintage American US Navy destroyer. But she's flying the White Ensign in World of Warships, so HMS Campbelltown it is, not to be confused with this HMS Campbelltown, which is a different kettle of fish entirely. No, the World of Warships HMS Campbelltown, despite being old, decrepit and obsolete at the time she saw her finest hour, was in fact a very, very famous warship for one very, very good reason. For those of you who have heard of Operation Chariot, you can probably skip the next ten minutes of this video. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it though. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who haven't, let me tell you the history of HMS Campbelltown, pennant number 142, Royal Navy. After the British Army was forced to evacuate from Dunkirk, Britain's back was right up against the wall. America was not yet in the war, Germany had not yet gone to war with Russia, and Britain was really starting to feel the pressure of the U-boat menace. Despite still having the largest navy in the world, we also had a pretty big empire to protect, and so there just weren't enough destroyers and escort vessels in particular to go around to safeguard the convoys upon which Britain depended for her very survival. The American President Roosevelt was sympathetic to Britain and did like Winston Churchill, but there was a presidential election coming up that year and he didn't want to be seen as a warmonger by his critics, so his hands were largely tied in the amount of assistance that he could offer to Britain. Nevertheless, at the same time, the Americans were keenly aware that it was highly likely that Britain was going to fall to Nazi Germany and they were very keen to get their hands on some vital British Atlantic Island possessions and turn them into bases before Britain fell and Germany took them. Churchill was having none of it. However, towards the end of the year things were looking increasingly grim and so Prime Minister Churchill reluctantly agreed to what became known as the Destroyers for Bases Agreement whereby the USA was granted 99-year rent-free leases on almost a dozen British Atlantic possessions for the establishment of naval and air bases and in return the US Navy used the opportunity to get rid of 50 of its most clapped out obsolete and decrepit destroyers <laughs> um, which had mostly been lying rusting quietly at anchor since the First World War uh, most of which were unfit for service and Churchill was basically forced to accept. Essentially, the USA stiffed us, but beggars can't be choosers. And one of these ships was the USS Buchanan, a Wix-class destroyer, which was now known as HMS Campbelltown. The Campbelltown was originally transferred to the Dutch government in exile in London and crewed by members of the Royal Netherlands Navy, but she was soon transferred back and flew under the White Ensign. Through the end of 1940 and throughout 1941 she served faithfully as a convoy escort in the Atlantic, but it was in 1942 where she would become famous. Operation Chariot, the raid on the Normandy dock in Saint-Nazaire. You see, the Royal Navy had a problem. They'd already sunk the Bismarck, but the Bismarck had a sister ship equally powerful, the Tirpitz. There was only one dry dock on the Atlantic in occupied German territory that was big enough to handle a battleship the size of the Tirpitz and that was the Normandy dock in the town of Saint-Nazaire on the French Atlantic coast. It was named after the passenger liner, the Normandy, which had been built there. If the Royal Navy could deny that dock to the Tirpitz then the Tirpitz would be forced to hide in the Norwegian fjords for the remainder of the war without easy access to the Atlantic from a French Atlantic port. And if the Tirpitz was confined in Norway, it would be a lot easier to keep her confined in Norway than it would be if she was allowed the free reign of the Atlantic from a French Atlantic port. The only problem was it was going to be really difficult to take this dry dock out. It couldn't be done from land because Saint-Nazaire was in German-occupied France. The Air Force claimed they could do it from the air, but the Air Force were incapable of landing more than 20% of their bombs within 5 miles of the target when bombing from high altitudes, such was the technology available at the time. A low-level air raid was out of the question. Saint-Nazaire was heavily defended by over 80 anti-aircraft batteries in and around the town itself. That just left an attack from the sea. However, this was not going to be easy. The dry dock was located several miles up the estuary of the Loire River, and Saint-Nazaire was also a U-boat base and was therefore heavily defended with multiple gun emplacements lining the mouth of the river estuary. 
The Royal Navy needed something expendable, and a clapped out obsolete old World War I destroyer like HMS Campbelltown seemed to fit the bill. Several modifications were made to the ship. They removed two of her four funnels and the other two funnels were raked in order to simulate the superstructure of a German torpedo boat. Anything unnecessary was stripped off the ship in order to lighten her weight. She was fitted with extra 20mm cannons and 24 Mark 7 depth charges comprising of 4.5 tons of high explosive were dumped into steel tanks which surrounded the beam which supported the forward gun mount. They were equipped with 8 hour time delayed fuses and then encased in cement to prevent anybody from messing around with them. On the 26th of May 1942, Campbelltown, along with 20 other motor, gun and torpedo boats, carrying 622 men of the Royal Navy and Army Commandos, left for the raid. Every possible precaution had been taken in order to deceive the Germans and allow the task force to get as far as possible down the river estuary before the game was up. The raid took place at night. Campbelltown had been modified to look, superficially at least, like a German vessel. She was also flying the German naval ensign. Naughty! The German naval codes had also been broken earlier in the war and this allowed the Campbelltown to give the correct responses to the various challenges that were flashed out to her from the gun positions lining the river estuary banks. Nevertheless, with just 2,000 yards to go before her objective, the game was finally up. Campbelltown was recognised and all hell broke loose. With her cover finally blown, Campbelltown's commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander Sam Beatty, ordered full speed ahead. The German ensign was hauled down, the Royal Navy battle ensign was hauled up, and Campbelltown surged for her target, ramming the dry docks just four minutes over schedule. With the ship wedged firmly into the dock, the crew manned every available gun position on the upper deck and set about giving covering fire to the 622 men of the Royal Navy and Army commandos who surged ashore both from the Campbelltown and the motor gun and torpedo boats on which they'd been travelling. These men also had vital jobs. It wasn't just enough to take out the dry dock gates, you also had to take out the winding and pumping stations which were essential for the dry dock maintenance and operations. This was going to be a tough fight, but the commandos and sailors achieved all of their objectives. All that remained now was to get out. 169 of the men had been killed, 64 commandos, 105 sailors. 215 were captured, and only 222 of the original force, over 600 strong, were evacuated by the surviving motor gunboats. A further five managed to evade capture and travelled overland through France to Spain and then on into Gibraltar, where they were eventually repatriated. At midday, the charges on the Campbelltown detonated. Five and a half tons of high explosives cemented into steel tanks under the bows of the ship. The damage was so extensive that the Normandy dry dock remained out of commission until 1947. The Tirpitz would be denied an Atlantic base with easy access to the ocean and would remain bottled up in the Norwegian fjords for the remainder of World War II before she would finally be sunk by tall boy bombs dropped by Royal Air Force Lancasters. By all accounts, the mission was a resounding success. It pissed Hitler off so much that he ordered any British commandos who were ever captured should be shot as spies on the spot. And that is the story of Operation Chariot, HMS Campbelltown's finest and final moment. So what's she like in World of Warships? Gotta be honest, her guns are pretty terrible. She's got three 102mm guns. The rate of fire isn't great, the range isn't great, the accuracy is pretty good. But it only has three of them. This is the big issue. The Wix, upon which it's based, has four. Okay, that's only one more, but look at the way the guns are arranged. It's got one in the front, which is in a turret. It's got one on the side, and one on the other side. This means it can never, ever fire more than two of these guns at a target at once. It can never fire all three guns at the same target. Now. There's a gun at the rear, but that's an anti-aircraft gun, and it's not a very good anti-aircraft gun either, so you're pretty much defenceless from behind in this ship, and even chasing another ship down, you've only really got one gun that can fire at them. So, yeah, the guns on this ship, while they're not as bad as the guns on the Watakati, the Japanese Tier 3, they're barely adequate. I think that's probably the, 
the best thing that we could say about them. The torpedoes, however, are interesting and easily the ship's best feature. It has six torpedo tubes arranged in two launchers for three tubes each, port and starboard side. The torpedoes have a 7.5 kilometer range. Now, when you take that into consideration, the ship also has a 6.5 kilometer surface detection range and a 3.1 kilometer air detection range means that we've got another ship, not just the Japanese, that can launch its torpedoes from outside of detection range. It's also pretty fast, has a top speed of 35 knots. The rudder shift time is very good, but the turning circle is kind of big. Going back to the guns for the moment, however, and I'm going to show you exactly why it is that the Campbelltown finishes third out of four when it comes to the guns on the Tier 3 destroyers. The Wix has one more gun, but it also has better range, better rate of fire, and because of the way the guns are situated on the ship, it's able to point more of those guns at a target than the Campbelltown is able to. The, the Dirtski, again, is another perfect example. Like the Campbelltown, it only has three guns, but they fire further, they fire faster, and because of the way the guns are arranged, all in centerline mounted turrets that are all capable of rotating 180 degrees, it's able to use all three of those guns almost all of the time. The Campbelltown, by comparison, even under the best possible circumstances, is only ever going to be able to fire at a target with two of those guns. But hey, at least the Campbelltown's got better guns than the Japanese Tier 3, and it's got better torpedoes than the Wix, and that's true. The individual torpedoes on the Campbelltown are better than the torpedoes on the Wix. They've got better range, and they're slightly faster. But the Wix has got twice as many of them. The Campbelltown only has two triple barrel launchers, one on the port side and one on the starboard side. The Wix has four of pretty much exactly the same triple barrel launchers, although they are firing inferior torpedoes, but it means that the Wix can launch a salvo of six torpedoes from each side. The Campbelltown, by contrast, can only launch three torpedoes from a side, and if it wants to get off more than that, it's got to spend time turning the ship around so it can bring the launchers on the other side of the ship to bear, and it doesn't have a particularly good turning circle. Not only that, while the torpedoes themselves are very good, the Campbelltown not only suffers from a limited number of torpedo launches in awkward placement, it also takes over a minute at Tier 3 to reload these launch tubes. Now, you can get that down to 57 seconds with the commander skill that reduces the reload of your torpedoes by 10%, but still, 57 seconds is a long time to be waiting to reload a torpedo tube in a Tier 3 destroyer. Nevertheless, despite the inadequate guns and the inflexible torpedo arrangement, I do still like this ship. I like having a low tier destroyer that can launch torpedoes from stealth that doesn't have to be Japanese, and that's pretty much exactly what you've got here. What it does mean, however, is that, well, because of the slow reload of the torpedoes and the limited amount of torpedoes that you're actually capable of putting into the water at a target, is that this is definitely the kind of destroyer that favours long, drawn-out battles, where it can keep the enemy at arm's length over a sufficient period of time to score hits at that 75 kilometer range, all the while trying to keep enemy destroyers at arm's length, because there's no way you're winning a gunfight in the Campbelltown unless you're fighting a Japanese destroyer, and even then it's going to be a close-run thing. Which is what makes the replay that I have for you all the more amusing, because absolutely none of that happens. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> without any further ado, let's see how this little thing fares in battle. First though, the one thing that you do need to bear in mind here is that in order to test drive these ships, we were given super tester accounts, purely for the purposes of having a go in the Campbelltown. And that, that doesn't mean I'm now a super tester for World of Warships. And no, it just means that I had limited access to the super tester server for the purposes of doing this video. Um, the thing that you need to know about the super test server is that there are not a lot of super testers around, and they're never all online at the same time. So the test server was basically deserted, and the only way you could actually get a battle in this little premium tier 3 destroyer was to play a co-op battle, and so that's pretty much what I was forced to do. Nevertheless, I think you'll agree, the results were pretty exciting. Under normal circumstances on this map, well, what you tend to see happen is everybody heads for the slot in the channel between the two big land masses. I wouldn't recommend that you adopt this as a standard strategy when you're in a ship like the Campbelltown. You do have that 7.5 kilometer range, 
and that 6.5 kilometer detection range and heading down into the narrow channel between the two main land masses here is a recipe for disaster in anything other than the fastest destroyer with the most torpedoes and that's definitely not the Campbell town you would probably if you weren't playing against bots and they didn't all just lemming train straight down into the middle of the map under normal circumstances playing a random battle on the live server you would probably have a lot more success in the Campbell town if you were instead to head north and east and hook your way around up into the northeast corner to get some long-range shots on the enemy cruisers and battleships as they come around from that direction or do exactly the same down to the south however my experience of playing co-op battles on the super test server meant that you pretty much have to get stuck in right from the start or you'll miss the action and so that's pretty much what I'm gonna do here and oh boy <laughs> it was fun of course, fun in a destroyer tends to equate to mind-bogglingly, stupidly, suicidally dangerous, and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was that as well. But, well, we'll wait until you see the results. So, yeah, uh, co-op battles. The second one ship gets spotted, everybody else surges in to fire at the first detected ship. That's just the way the bots play, but it's not entirely different from the way players play down at Tier 3 either. Smokescreen spotted down at the south, friendly destroyer up ahead. He's generating smoke. This should give me some measure of concealment as I make my approach. You're going to see me doing things here, by the way, that I would never do in a random battle, not with other players involved, like this, for example. Very, very risky torpedo launch. Good chance I'm actually going to hit the Wix class destroyer up ahead of me, but I'm playing against bots. I don't really care. Um, <laughs> Torpedoes away again. It's going to be very, very dangerous torpedo launch here, firing ahead of the track of a friendly destroyer. So many torpedoes in the water down here. Very, very narrowly managed to avoid that one. Wix up ahead is in serious trouble. He's not going to last much longer. The guns are pointing in this direction. I start shooting into the smoke. Lots and lots of enemy ships coming in from the port side. Torpedoes have scored some hits there. Two hits, claimed one victim, but there's still a torpedo in the water and it's still running towards the target. There's another swarm of torpedoes comes in from the starboard side. There you go, I've hit something else with the other torpedo. A second kill, don't know what it is, don't really have the time. <laughs> with all of this fire coming in at me as I turn to avoid the torpedoes launched by the Campbelltown on the enemy team and trying to bring my guns to bear on him. There are shots coming in from all different directions. About half of my health is gone. Uh, I'm shielded for the moment by the wreck of that sinking destroyer as this Tenryu comes around and just launches complete overkill. Uh, two different launchers right into the side of that Campbelltown narrowly missed me. Torpedoes are back up on this side, I'll fire them away and I'm not, I'm just getting out of here now. I mean look at that crossfire. Um, I'm crippled, disabled, immobilized, another torpedo kill. <laughs> But I've definitely outstayed my welcome here. Burn the damage control ability, get my engines back up and running as friendly fire goes zipping right over the top of my mast, narrowly missing. Uh, I'm getting the hell out of dodge. Although, hold on, the guns are pointing in the right direction. I can ninja yet another kill on a low health enemy cruiser. And, uh, and just turn slightly to starboard to bring my guns to bear. Uh, knock out some gun turrets on the enemy cruiser down there. And, uh, and hopefully they're engaging targets like these Kolberg class cruisers that are far, far closer to him. He's down as well, and there are only... That, that's it, there's only one ship left on the enemy team. How am I still alive? Um, <laughs> I have no idea. How did I sail into the teeth of that and, and come out barely floating? Your guess is as good as mine. One enemy ship left, Tenryu, Tier 3 Japanese cruiser. Although he's about to claim a kill, but it's not going to be enough. Um, my first torpedo launch against him was a complete waste of time. The second he killed that enemy, well, sorry, enemy to him, but the second he killed that friendly ship down there, he immediately turned and started heading down this channel. So those torpedoes are not going to hit. That means I cannot engage him on my port side anymore, which is a shame because he's on my port side. I'm going to have to move around to his port side so I can fire at him with the torpedo launchers on my starboard side. And I thought that if I just reversed a bit and waited for him to settle on course attacking all of these friendly ships who are closer to him than me, I'd be able to get a nice long-range torpedo shot off. 
this was not to be. He's decided I need to die, and he's steaming straight down in this direction. And he's turning slightly there in order to try to get his port torpedo launchers to bear at me. But I've realized what he's doing, and so I start to outrun him, because I need to get on the other side of his ship, or for him to at least steady on a course in order to get these torpedoes away. But he starts turning around, and now he's going to give me the batteries on the other side. So right now it's just a question of who's going to get their torpedoes away first. And... I'm slowing and turning and attempting to avoid his torpedoes, but I don't need to because he was the last ship on the enemy team, and as soon as he's dead, while his torpedoes would have killed me, the match ended, so I got away with it. Six torpedo hits, five kills, a couple of gun hits. Um, I was going to say inconsequential gun hits with the Campbelltown, but one of those gun hits actually secured a kill. And while you don't earn any credits, experience, or free experience when you're playing on the Super Test server, the post-battle results screen do at least show you how you would have done. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. And it's totally not the way you should be playing the Campbelltown. Um, <laughs> so, well, how relevant this particular battle was for a review perspective is completely open to question, but I wanted to show it anyway because it was so much fun. If I had actually approached this Solomon Islands match in the correct way to play a Campbelltown, the enemy team would have been dead before I even saw any of them. So, yeah, as I am very, very fond of saying, if it's stupid but it works, it ain't stupid. So, HMS Campbelltown, formerly the USS Buchanan, Wix-class destroyer, and now a Tier 3 premium British town-class destroyer. I, I do like the ship, primarily because I like having a destroyer that can launch its torpedoes from stealth and not be Japanese. And so that alone uh, makes this an enjoyable ship to play in my book. However, be warned, the nature of its weapons loadout does make this an inflexible kind of ship to play. It can only ever fire at most two of its 102mm pop guns at a target at once. And you will find yourselves in situations where you can't bring any of your three guns to bear on a target, particularly if you're trying to take evasive action and get away from your tormentors. Also, the torpedoes, while they are very, very good, it can only fire three from each side. And even with the relevant commander crew skills, it'll still take 57 seconds to reload them. And I have been in situations in this ship where my team basically got wiped out almost immediately. And that leaves you with a big, big hill to climb in any ship, but particularly in the Campbelltown. Because with three torpedoes firing every 57 seconds, it is going to take you a long time to whittle down the superior force of enemy ships. And if they have any destroyers amongst them, you're probably going to come off second best. Because aside from the Japanese destroyers, there isn't anybody that the Campbelltown is likely to beat in a gunfight. That means that there are only really two things that the Campbelltown's good at. Uh, long-range sniping with its long-range torpedoes and hit-and-run tactics. But it is good in that limited specialization. So... A highly specialised ship, but a good one nevertheless. And I really can't wait for this thing to come out on the live server. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but I suspect it isn't going to be before too long. And it's not just because it flies the White Ensign. I have enjoyed playing the Campbelltown on the Super Test server. It is a good little ship. I do like it. And I suspect a lot of you will too. So, HMS Campbelltown, pennant number 142, town class destroyer of Her Majesty's Royal Navy. I hope you've enjoyed today's video, folks. And as always, take care. And I'll catch you next time.